lose it. Get rid of it. No longer control it. Don't own it. This is the way I start with the students. I don't, I tell them, say anything you want about the homily, but don't say you don't remember what I talked about. <laughs> so lose it. This is the part of today's scripture that I believe is the most important for you today, that in fact, he who loses his life for my sake, for the Lord's sake, will save it. I'm sure that 90% of the people here have consecrated their life at some time to God, have dedicated their life some time, have professed it, and have put it out there as best they could for God. The problem is, with most of us, and with most of the people I counsel, that if you take inventory, even though you've done all that, you still got it. You're still controlling it. You're still holding on to it. Maybe not everything. It can be something dumb. Like I remember when I took solemn vows and I was feeling, I had done it all now, Lord. There's nothing left. And that night when I was praying, I felt the Lord said to me, what about your tennis racket? I'd given everything away, but I was afraid. I mean, the brothers weren't that good at tennis. They still believed that if they were frustrated, they'd bang the racket on the court. And so I kind of slipped that one away so nobody could touch my tennis racket. Well, what part of our lives are we afraid to lose? You see, this goes right with... Who do you say I am? You are Christ, the Son of the living God. Great, now give me all of your life. I do a lot of counseling with the students in terms of decisions, vocational decisions, where to put their life. I've just finished a manuscript. It needs a lot of work, but anyhow, it's going to get published on deciding God's will for your life. Usually when I counsel the students, I get to a point, they usually are quite honest. I get to a point and I say, are you ready to give that over to God? Are you ready to totally just do what he wants? Usually they say, you know, I don't think I'm ready. I say, well, thank God you're honest. You know the difference between good people and great people, don't you? Way down implicitly, you know there's a separate category for John Paul II, Mother Teresa, uh, down the line, uh, all the various North American martyrs, Damien and Molokai, that whole crowd. And what do you think the difference is between the good, doing good work for God, being saved, and the great? you listen to the media, they were born that way. Wrong, original sins on all of us. You don't get born that way. Or, well, they just happen to be in the right place at the right time. Wrong, wrong. We've all been in a lot of good places. <laughs> what is it? What's the difference between a good life and a holy life, a saintly life? Is it just an accumulation? I would suggest to you the difference for the saints is they've lost it. They don't have their life anymore. They know, act, believe, and then daily have to do it again that God has their life and that they're following God and they turn to God for every decision where they could otherwise be pulling it back. They've made the break. 
I believe you're special people. I believe any people that would come as hungry for truth as you are and sit here from, uh, from early morning to late at night applauding and seeking more and more truth, you're special people. And I believe God's calling you to do great things, to be great, to be holy, to make the break. You say it isn't easy. That's no news. It never has been. Well, it takes courage. Ah, yes. Well, where do we get the courage? Here's the key. Here's the key. What happens in our lives? There are three stages. This isn't very complicated stuff. You get the truth in your head. Then, as they say, the longest trip in life is between your head and your heart. And you have to move the truth from your head to your heart till it becomes the desire of your life. It becomes your treasure. It becomes what you're willing to sell all the rest for. And then you have your treasure and you have to move it into action. Get the truth. Get it in your heart. Then act out of your heart to do it. That is the whole secret. I remember when Mother Teresa was here. I've been with her a few times, but her effortless freedom to say to people, say, oh, Mother, you're doing wonderful work. And she says, well, what are you doing? <laughs> and, you're saying, and, and a couple people came up to her and said, oh, Mother, I want to help you poor in India. She says, have you helped the poor in your own town? And you stumble a little. Then she'd say to them, would you like me to go down and show them to you? It really gets embarrassing. <laughs> the whole point is she's free. She's gone. She doesn't, well, I wonder how they'll feel if I speak the truth. Or I wonder, you know, didn't you love the scene when they gave her the fancy building and they were so proud of it, they gave her the fancy building in San Francisco. Do you see that picture? All the carpets being thrown out the window and <laughs> the whole thing being redone right after they gave it to her. She's throwing away a lot of this stuff. Where do you get that freedom? She's passed over the line. Damien and Molokai being one of those priests sitting around in Belgium and the bishop says, I need somebody to go to live and die among lepers. You'll never come back. You just go there and you'll probably die of leprosy. You'll never see any family member or friend again. You'll be totally among strangers who are dying all around you with rotting, stinking flesh. Is there anybody that's ready to volunteer? Damien puts up his hand. Yeah, sounds like God to me. <laughs> and he goes and does it. The North American martyrs, Isaac Jobs, John Verbuff, those kind of people, after they took off, took off Isaac Jobs' fingers, and he was a wreck, and they brought him back to France and told, gave him a nice little retreat house where he could stay and said, uh, would you like to do that or do something else? He says, I want to go back to the same Indians and preach the gospel. When they checked the, uh, the spiritual diaries of these people, what did they find there? They had been begging God for the grace to be martyrs. John, Isaac, and the rest. It goes on into our day. The choice is really there for all of us. Why? Because it won't be our work. You say, I'm too weak. Big news. I'm too weak. How does the process happen? Where does the courage come from? The courage, according to Scripture, comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what makes the difference. Isn't it interesting? John Paul, who, by the grace of God and blessing, I've been with a couple of times. I just recently was next to him as a principal concelebrant at the altar and was able to look into his face through all his prayer time and then be with him afterwards and pray along in rhythm with him. And when you hear that groaning, when you hear that prayer that reaches so much deeper than anyone's prayer you've heard before, as he yearns forth, 
for the triumph of God and the coming of Jesus in his own life and others. When you hear that, you know this man is just totally given over to God's purpose and God's will. And so when they write in the book, The Threshold, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, and Vittoria, uh, the re reporter asks him, uh, how does the Pope pray? His first answer is, the Pope prays as the Spirit permits him to pray. Oh, there's enormous wisdom there. If a man's totally given to God, how does he do anything? According to how the Holy Spirit leads him. According to how the, the Holy Spirit wants to move and change him and change the church and the world through him. To be totally given over. To pray that kind of way. The Pope quotes Romans 8 on that. And... Uh, We must be saying we must pray with inexpressible groanings in order to enter into the Spirit's rhythm. And uh, he describes his own prayer life as groaning in the Spirit for that victory of Romans 8.26, which is the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans, that words cannot express. How, how can this happen in our lives? How can we make the difference? Cross, not just live good lives, but live lives that bring forth the kingdom of God, that reach out and embrace others. Lives that take this truth that you've taken in this weekend and make it advance against the kingdoms of darkness and secularism and humanism and the rest. The answer in every single case in the Old and the New Testament, the answer in the lives of the saints is prayer. To go out in the cause of Jesus Christ without praying is as stupid as playing in a national NFL football game without ever having practiced. And the same results will happen. Prayer, to truly give ourselves over in prayer. First, so that the truth gets in our hearts, and then what's in our hearts gets into action. You see, courage, etymologically, in Latin and French, comes from core, agere, it means to act out of the heart. It doesn't mean something great. It's acting out of what you most deeply and firmly believe, rather than what's convenient, what seems kind of prudent, giving the people around us, what I can negotiate by not giving up too much to get what I want. It's acting out of the deepest conviction of my heart and standing for it. And how many of you know that isn't easy? You've got to get equipped for it. You've got to have the decision made in the heart in order to put it into action when you're out there against the resistance, the contradictions, the mockery, the laughter, those that want to call you a fanatic, a fool, not reasonable, not balanced, and all the rest. You know, I never yet have found a saint that was canonized because he was balanced. No, with all due respect, have I found one where they said his greatest virtue was openness. As I said in the opening night, the virtue, openness is a virtue to receive, not one of our the vir virtues of religion, but a human virtue. However, it has to be balanced by closeness, <laughs> which is when you close on the truth, because it's truth, and you don't let it get watered down or diluted to act out of the heart. 
what I tell our students, basing very much on John Paul's teaching, is that there's a desire in every young person, and therefore on all of us, because we were young once, to do two things, to possess our lives and to know love. Everyone. John Paul preaches this in his youth days and the rest. Those two things are common throughout the world. Parents, you want to know why you get a little resistance in those teenage years early on, or maybe everything up to outright rebellion and organized revolution. It's, uh, it has a, that desire to fully possess my life, mine, my, I, me, I, all that stuff is there. That is human nature. And then that desire to know I'm loved and to find a loving relationship. But the key to life is once you've got the possession, we call this on this campus adult conversion, then you get the opportunity to have it all, to find it all, because you can give it to God. It's only when you've possessed your life, you give it to God. And there you find the love. Ah, the love of God. Ah, the love given of God. The tremendous koinonia, the fellowship love flows from first knowing your love from, love from God and all other loves can build on it. I tell our students very simply, don't get confused between pleasure, happiness, and joy. If you've given your life to God, if you've made the break, if you've done the courageous act, if you've lost it, you have a joy that no one can ever take from you. I don't care the tragedy. I don't care the breakup in the family. I don't care the seemingly scandals. I don't care how bankrupt you get underneath everything you experience, there's a joy. And that's why Paul can say, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in all circumstances. The joy of God is a gift that comes from giving our lives totally to God. Now, above that is this thing called happiness, which is a mental type of perspective where we decide that we've achieved something that we're after and we have something we wanted, and we feel happy about it. And above that is this pleasure, which is sensual. Ooh, it tastes good, it feels good, I, I like it, all that stuff. So you have the pleasure and the happiness. God doesn't say you'll always have pleasure. God doesn't say you'll always be happy, but he does say you'll always have joy. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? You can do it. Thousands, millions have done it before you. And it's never too late. It's never too late. Live for God. How do you do it? Very simply. Every morning. Pray. And pray through everything you're going to do that day and every decision. Make it according to God's will as best you can. Make that commitment and go out and do it. And God will gradually take more and more control of your life until, as Cantalamessa writes in his books on, on obedience, Cantalamessa being the papal preacher, he says, the joy of life and God's greatest joy is when he can take a hold of our lives and steer them as a steersman on a wheel or somebody on a bicycle or motorcycle just moves back and forth and our lives are, are given over to God and his purpose. This is the goal. This is the answer. Much more, but I'm not going to go any further. Bishop Sean Barnes coming out with a new book on the catechism. He wrote a meditation for every day of the year on the catechism. I just finished reviewing it. Ignatius Press will be coming out with it. He has a passage there in the Holy Spirit explaining clearly why it's the Holy Spirit that takes over our life and enables us to pray, to, re to rejoice, to give it, to bring forth the kingdom of God. 
I would suggest, finally, that you do just one thing. You've dedicated, consecrated, made intentions, done morning offerings, done all the stuff. Just ask the Holy Spirit to show you what you're still holding on to, what you haven't lost, what is the pullback, what's for a rainy day that you've held on to, what's the area that he calls you to move out, and you're saying, eh, not yet, or I can't, or I'm too weak. Take it to prayer. God will show you the joy that no man, that no circumstances can ever take from you forever and ever and ever through this life and reigning in the kingdom of God. Lose it. Amen.